Hello everybody and welcome to um, today's webinar and thank you so so much for joining us. Um, I'm Natalie, I'm the CEO at Profusion and for those of you who don't know us we're a data agency and consultancy who just love using the power of data science to try and personalize the customer experience and that personalized customer experience is what we're here to talk about today. We've got a really brilliant panel to engage with um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, in just a minute. We're also going to make sure that there's plenty of time um, for your Q&A. So you'll see that there's a, a poll area, um, uh, sorry, a chat area. So please do put your Q&A in there and we'll make sure we challenge our panel with them. We don't want them walking away too easily today. We'll challenge our panel with them slightly later on. Um, we've already seen a huge shift to digital in the retail industry over the last 10 years, which has worked wonderfully well for many things. Um, but yes, I'm prepared to buy a pen without seeing it, or maybe a yoga mat or without trying it, possibly even a TV. Um, but given that I dread the day that people very, very kindly and generously give me perfume as presents, however lovely and expensive, sometimes for whatever reason it is, my skin still makes them smell like I've gone into the changing rooms with a bunch of teenage boys and got absolutely drowned in the Lynx effect, um, which at this age and stage of my life is probably not what I'm really looking for. So would I really be prepared to buy a perfume, a wine, a blusher without seeing it in person, trying it first? And would you be prepared to do that? The luxury products, it's always been about how do we create an experience? And the shift to online left real questions on could you actually create that? Could you recreate that luxury experience? Could you make it truly personal? Can you get them to buy something that's personal, subjective, expensive, without ever having had an experience of it before? And then the pandemic hit. So whether we wanted to or not, we pretty much were forced to move things online and there wasn't a choice about it. Um, we've got close to half of retail sales taking place online. Recent stats, could I ask everybody else to mute themselves just so we don't get an echo? That would be great, thank you. Um, recent stats from McKinsey say, I think it's 75% of um, consumers who've tried shopping digitally have agreed that they're going to continue to buy online. So there's no escaping the need to digitalize this try before you buy experience or indeed flip people to be prepared to buy before you try. But the big question, which hopefully we're going to give you a bit of inspiration about today, is how do you do that? Um, and we actually want to start with a couple of questions for our audience. Um, so um, just pop in the Q&A any thoughts on this. We'll see whether how much anyone gets right. Um, so my first question is, what percentage of customers do you now think shop online on a weekly basis? So anyone wants to take a guess? Well, we've got, well, we've got a whole range, 30, 85, 84, 60, 50, 80, you're all actually quite generous, uh, bar one, and it's currently 36%. So it's not online ever, it's online weekly. Um, and it's 36%, which is actually a 28% increase since the pre pandemic times. And then the other one, which I'll be really impressed if anyone gets right, though if there are any of my team who have joined, you're not allowed to answer this. Um, and Dan's also not allowed to answer this, one of our speakers, because I've already bored him with this. Um, so what is the most predictive factor in whether you want, whether you like a perfume or an aftershave that you buy? What do people think that might be? Price, packaging, age, look, brand, smell, whether it lasts. The marketing, the popularity, the reviews. But do the reviews affect whether you actually like it? It might drive you to buy it. Any other ideas about what might affect whether you like it or not? No other ideas. Well, actually, none of those things. It's whether or not you believe in the death penalty. Um, which I would have been very amazed if anyone had guessed. Um, we recently built a personality driven product recommendation engine for Coty, and that was our finding. Um, 
don't worry, we did think perhaps best not to lead the customer facing tool with that and use some of the other um, also predictive questions to identify what they might want to buy. Um, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor of the fact that it's just not as simple as simply moving things online and thinking that you can just um, find a way to engage people in your products. Because if the most predictive question of whether you're going to like a perfume or aftershave is whether you believe in the death penalty, it's going to be quite hard to create that um, trap for you by experience. Don't worry, we did manage it. Um, and that is why we also have an amazingly experienced panel here today who are going to share some of their wisdom and experiences. And I'm now going to ask them to introduce themselves and just say a few words about their work in this area. So, David, I'm going to come to you first, please. Thanks, Natalie. So, yeah, I'm David Sinfield. So I'm currently uh, head of CRM at Majestic. Um, I started the pandemic. I work for a, a, an agency called More2 who works with uh, lots of multi-channel retailers. So that was the uh, the start of the pandemic. So saw quite a lot of data coming in uh, right at the start. But um, a lot most of the time over the last year trying to uh, keep the store experience going uh, for our for our customers so yeah it's been a, been a pretty interesting year from from that perspective to nick and ask him to introduce himself hello everyone thank you for having me um i've not used this platform before so i am having some uh, some mild technical issues but i hope you can all hear me okay um, yes, my name is Nick Buckley. I'm the, the, the Chief Marketing Officer for L'Oreal here in the Nordics, so covering Denmark, Sweden, Norway and Finland. Uh, prior to, uh, I've been here for two years, prior to, prior to this role I was in the UK with L'Oreal as the, as the Chief Digital Officer. Hi, I'm Dan Hopbeld, uh, Red Ant's uh, Chief Technology Officer. Um, I've worked with high street retailers and luxury brands for people like Chanel and Burberry, and also big box retailers like Sophology and Furniture Village. Uh, I've been with Red Ant for more than a decade now, um, and Red Ant's software platform, Retail OS, um, is helping innovative luxury and makeup brands like Charlotte Tilbury uh, to create some great virtual shopping experiences whilst customers at home. Well, I'm going to pick on you then, Dan, and perhaps you could just give us a bit more of a flavour of the types of virtual experiences that you've been creating and some of the impacts that they've had. Yeah, so obviously um, we've worked with uh, in the retail space for uh, probably about seven or eight years now, and most of the technologies we provide are focused around sales assistants. So how to better help sales assistants in store um, really use digital digital uh, facilities that retailers already have, uh, but to help better, you know, help, help uh, customers, help serve them better, help know what their needs are. Um, and obviously the pandemic hit um, and a lot of stores uh, went dark. Um, and one of the uh, key uh, innovations that, that sort of that allowed retailers to focus on is, is actually how do we better potentially utilize our sales assistants? Um, so we've been working with um, several retailers to basically uh, use our platform to do things like um, online masterclasses, um, virtual consultations where there's a personal shopping experience, either video or, or by call, um, and actually use the, um, the, the expertise of a sales assistant and the knowledge of a sales assistant to really help sort of drive through a sale and especially areas of considered purchase where maybe you've got multiple different touch points already, you know, customers are already looking online um, and they are, uh, they're basically wanting that, that extra support, that extra knowledge, or, or just also to, to find out more. One of the biggest difficulties with online is surfacing new inspiration, new um, things that you might not already know exist. You know, if you've got a search term, it's easy, but if you don't have a search term, it's a bit more difficult. So um, that's sort of where we've been helping quite a lot of the brands that we work with. Um, and I think it's, it, it, one of the big things that we've seen is that actually um, the uh, the sales system in themselves can create a huge amount of, of uplift in basket value. And with the, some of the remote selling tools that we've we've now got, even stores that have been dark have been able to keep similar levels of sales and transaction value by just doing it virtually. Able to achieve that. and. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what's been happening at L'Oreal and perhaps some of the um, learnings you've had there from some of this digitalizing try before you buy? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, 
it's, it's worth pointing out that um, just just what's happened over the last 18 months or so has just had a massive, massive uh, impact on our business. Uh, and we see, just have seen a massive sort of channel and consumer shift, uh, of course, online. Um, of course, uh, we are what we call a, a beauty pure player. So all we sell and all we know is, is beauty, beauty brands uh, covering a variety of categories. So fragrances, makeup, uh, hair, skincare, etc. cetera. Um, and we were fortunate enough to buy uh, a technology about uh, two, two and a half years ago uh, called Modiface. Um, and it's a sort of an augmented reality uh, technology uh, and application where consumers can try on virtually uh, a whole bunch of whole bunch of products, uh, including makeup and skincare, uh, hair coloration and, and hair care. And we have seen just a massive, massive increase in the amount of consumers uh, using that technology and that service, both on our, on our own touch points and our own platforms but more and more uh, in collaboration with our retailers. So we actually offer the technology with our retailers uh, globally across, uh, across all countries uh, in the world. And um, we've actually just seen a massive, massive increase in the conversion rate uh, of those consumers who are engaging with the technology versus those who are, who are not, uh, in fact, over, over double uh, the conversion rate of, a, of an ordinary uh, product page. Um, so we see, we've seen that train, uh, trend happen over the last year or so and uh, just continue to, to explode. And so we're now working with all the retail partners on how we can continue that uh, momentum and actually widen the, widen the services that we offer to consumers. So, for example, having a skin diagnostic, uh, so where um, the technology will scan uh, consumers' uh, skin and their face and then uh, report on the condition of their skin and then therefore recommend uh, the most appropriate product. Um, that's just one example, and we're, we're doing that across pretty much all of the, all of the categories that we're, that, we're, that we're live in. And like I say, the, the feedback direct from consumers has been uh, amazingly positive. So it's something we'll continue to scale and, and grow across uh, all of our own touch points, but also with um, all of our retail partners. Particular groups of customers, like age groups or demographics, or any certain patterns, the types of customers who are particularly engaged and converted, you, you said that you've had such a high conversion rate using these tools. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, the way we look at our consumers is we have a consumer segmentation model, uh, which um, provides eight different segments. Um, so it does vary, uh, it does vary by, by segment. Um, Typically, the, the the segments which you would traditionally uh, classify as slightly older are particularly interested in uh, skincare, skincare diagnostics. Um, and we've also seen skincare regimes get far more complex over the last uh, eighteen months or so. So consumers using more and more products as part of their skincare regime and a more variety of products. So uh, typically, uh, the older demographics um, and segments. Uh, particularly interested and therefore enjoying the, the skincare category and then uh, no surprises but um, the, the younger audiences and um, uh, other segments are, are more interested in the, the makeup category and, and testing and sampling uh, new products uh, and a wider portfolio of products they wouldn't ordinarily um, use so yeah it's kind of a, a mixed bag but we've seen it we've seen consistently across all age groups all segments that in some way shape or form they are um, using this technology and and enjoying it and as a result uh, buying buying more and more often. You have brought on hundreds of thousands of new customers um, during lockdown. I'm not sure what that says about um, all of those of us uh, who are, who are customers. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how um, you've been sort of really fueling the the online journey and and what's that's enabled you to learn about your customers and yeah, I think um, obviously very, very different to Nick, Nick's area. Um, I'm not sure we can quite digitise the tasting, uh, the tasting experience of wine. But I think, um, I think our approach is a bit, bit of a mindset actually that you know how do we if you can't come to the store, how do we get the store to you? Um, and I think right at the beginning we made the decision that although the, the stores were dark, that the stores would still continue to to trade, um, and eat each store effectively becoming a, a mini mini warehouse in it in its own right and that allowed the the relationships to continue with with customers so rather than sort of pushing everybody to on online um to the to the website to be able to have that relationship with with the store um and what became um, not overly digital what became phenomenally important is is the telephone relationship so um the that 
with the stores, with the staff in store, having the time to be able to do it. They can lay their store out differently um, and then spend the time talking to customers over the phone. So a lot of those discussions that would happen naturally in a, in a store could actually happen over the phone. And that would be around you know, what products do you recommend? I like this. Have you got this, et cetera. So um, I think we, we were able to with the restrictions that we had, particularly right at the start, just keep keep as much of the, you know, sounds a bit sort of uh, corporate speak, but, you know, keep as much of the proposition going uh, as possible, even with the restrictions that we had. In terms of the piece you were talking about, Nick, you talked about um, the conversions being particularly higher. One of the things that I know people get nervous about is buyer's remorse and interested to see whether um you've seen that or whether you've seen that um it's typically higher or lower in these scenarios or does it stay pretty steady um as happens in your in the stores where in the way that they normally sell it um yeah so uh, yes and no is the answer um so typically the, the makeup category is a, a category a category where consumers are more inclined to test stuff they have not used before uh the price point is far far lower so the average price of a makeup product is about four four or five euros um so even if a consumer is not necessarily happy with the product they purchase they're, they're quite fickle and they'll go and try something else quite easily and quickly without necessarily having that remorse um so so for makeup no is the answer that that's almost part of the the consumer journey is they like to buy a wide variety of products and are not necessarily as loyal as with other categories or other um, other products. For skincare, a little bit. So skincare is a far more considered purchase. So that's where we really spend a lot of time uh, trying to educate and uh, talk about uh, how to use the, the the products, how to use it uh, in conjunction with other skincare products um, to really get the the full benefits. Um, so so I wouldn't say we have had buyers remorse, but I think it's a far more considered purchase. Uh, and that's where you know some of the other uh, marketing topics come into pl into play around the, the content we're creating, the educational content, the tutorials, uh, and then distributing that content uh, across as many as many different places as we can, such as YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, etc. So whenever consumers have these questions and these concerns about how to use these products, um, we have the right content in the most appropriate places to answer those questions. So uh, yeah, yes and no is the answer. David, because I know a lot of for a lot of people that the way to try and tackle this is to make returns as easy as possible to um, sort of try and support the e-commerce proposition, and that's supported the sort of engagement of customers who who might just push themselves over the edge on something that they otherwise typically wouldn't buy online. And um, not not so easy for certain goods like food and drink. And wondered what your thoughts are on sort of how you can address that issue, but still. And um, sort of create the right digital experiences. Yeah, I think um, I mean it's, it's simple things like a no a no quibble guarantee, um, and just to if if customers do want to return it, you know, making it as e as easy as possible to do. It doesn't it, you know it doesn't happen hugely. I think we're as I say slight advantage that people um, accept that they won't necessarily like every wine that they they try. Um, but I I think it's a little bit about just being as as helpful as possible as you can to customers to to be able to um, allow them to bring stuff back and not question it and not you know make it not put time restrictions on it etc you know, that really the objective is to keep that customer for as long as we possibly can so I think that it's kind of again the approach we've always taken but probably in the last year been taken it to a, another a sort of slightly higher level of uh, flexibility but uh, there aren't there aren't that many that comes there aren't that many comes back we don't sell any uh, any any poor wine so uh, <laughs> but we'd like to think so okay. and um so we talked a little bit already about the customer experience um and i'm actually gonna gonna start with you dan but do others chip in um, let's talk a little bit about the technology that goes behind this because it all sounds brilliant. I can hold something up to, to my face and suddenly you can tell me more about my skin than I ever probably wanted to realise because um, it's probably had too much sun and things like that over its life. Um, and I definitely am not brilliant at moisturising every night before I go to bed. So you'll probably tell me all sorts of products 
that I need to buy. Um, but how does it all work? So, Dan, I know you've been busy creating these um, technical solutions for lots of different retailers. Um, how do you really re replace with digital those senses of touch and smell and, um, you know, physical presence? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to answer in terms of um, direct replacements. Um, and I think part of the part of the element is not necessarily to try and completely replace some of those some of those things. You're, you know, you're not going to get the smell through through the internet, so to speak. Um, but I think uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the work that retailers have done recently um, that possibly didn't sound particularly sexy, and that, and that maybe a lot of um, a lot of people in the business may not have understood too much things like consolidating systems together, making sure that systems can talk to one another, all the sort of, I suppose, what seems quite boring um, groundwork that retailers have been doing over probably the past five five years or so, really within the past two or three that, that's, that's made big strides, um, has helped a lot of businesses put this stuff together. So you know, allowing things like um, you know, being able to connect a sales assistant directly to a customer who's a valued customer who might be about to convert, understanding that, um, you know, a customer goes through multiple parts of their journey where they may research online, they may talk to somebody, they may look at reviews, but the, the purchase process might change from customer to customer, from channel to channel. All of those, all of that groundwork really is, has set some retailers apart from others in terms of being able to capitalize on um, on, on actually doing things digitally. Um, and I think there's, there's no real replacement for, for context, you know, actually having a, a conversation with somebody, having, you know, a nice video about a product, being able to, to try on some things virtually, you're not, they're not, it's not going to ever be exactly the same as, as, you know, really being able to try something on in real life, but it all adds to the context about buying a product and making a purchase decision. And I think that's the thing. It's sort of, it's, um, it's, it's small, small steps and lots of buildup of those steps over a wide variety of channels basically helps helps a customer get buy-in, not just to the product, but to the brand itself. And I think that's that's really the aim um, from the technology piece. I think some of the challenges um, around that as, as well um, are, you know, like I said, being able to actually try something on, um, but, uh, being able to smell something, doing things like at-home samples and following those up with a concerted sort of journey that, that fits together in terms of contacting them, uh, as we talked about, by phone, by video, um, doing sort of automated follow-ups and smart follow-ups using AI, those sorts of things together really create a strong sort of purchase process that allows somebody to, to, to buy into the brand and to, and to buy a product with confidence. Yeah, I guess and just to just to sort of bring that to life a little bit, or try from a from a L'Oreal perspective, we've um, we're very fortunate to partner with some uh, some startup incubators. So um, in the UK, Founders Factory in in France, Station F, uh, and with some of some of those partnerships, we get to collaborate with um, sort of uh, new, new technologies uh, um, uh, which are which are working in this space. And so one one uh, one use case we tested was. Um, uh, in fragrances actually so maybe not so much uh, scratch and sniff but what we delivered to consumers is um, is uh, an opportunity to, to to fill in a very short number of questions in, talk, in terms of talking about the types of fragrances they like do they like uh, woody tones do they like uh, musky smells uh, and they filled in a, a short questionnaire and then what we did is we uh, collected that collected that information and then uh, created uh, half a dozen or so sample size fragrances uh, and that was uh, in, in packaging that would, would fit through the letterbox. Um, and then uh, the consumer could purchase that for, I don't know, five, five ten euros or something. Um, and then has the opportunity, if they liked one of those five, they could then buy the, buy the full size product um, and they would get the, um, the, the price that they spent on the, on the sample. They would get that offered the full size product. So uh, just ways in which we can try and yeah, you know, have an integrate sort of O plus O, so online and offline. Uh, to try and sort of meet some of these needs to these categories and these products, which is it's really hard to to translate uh, virtually and through through digital. And we've seen we've seen that work really well with quite a few brands in terms of um, actually creating a bit of an experience around uh, receiving a set of samples, receiving a set of, of things that maybe are small versions or or, or 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 tasters, and then building up an experience around that. People are actually prepared to pay for that. It's not something you have to necessarily give away for free as a company if you can build a, a you know a nice experience around that that sort of part of the process. I very much welcome that solution for, for wine as well. So maybe it's a potential business. Potential business yeah, I think business. it is. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, there are, it, it is happening out there and certainly accelerated over, over the last year. I think Waitrose do it quite well as well. Um, you can you know, do a virtual um, pick up a pack. You actually have to pay pay for that. And then it's done via a Zoom pasting. Um, and I think one of the out, positive outcomes of the pandemic will just be the, the way that we can actually use Zoom, et cetera, going forward. And the fact that people, particularly you know, older customer base, are, are quite happy to now do do things through through that route so the the ability to take you know send out six bottles of wine and then run a tasting for for those for anybody that wants to join it i think gives us uh, it, not everybody wants to come into store and taste because you've got to drive etc cetera, etc cetera. but actually tastings tastings at home and via zoom is uh, certainly one of the things that i think will be here to stay one of, one of the positives of this uh, <laughs> of, of this situation Thinking about, we've talked about some of the brilliant positives. Um, one of the challenges as you try and get under the skin of consumers that I know a lot of brands um, struggle with, and we've seen from our own experience, I, I talked earlier about the death penalty being predictive of perfumes, right? That feels highly personal to talk to ask somebody who you've but a customer you've potentially never engaged with before, well, do you believe in the death penalty? Um, as the first thing you ask them, it's probably not what you're going to do. So, um, you know, when we really want to get under the skin of consumers and differentiate them effectively, that can require us to ask questions that get perceived as very sensitive, perhaps political, perhaps very personal. And in a climate of increased concern over data security and personal privacy, um, why should they trust such data? And how do you build that? trusted relationship with your customer and the value that they can get from that. Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, for, for, for us, it's quite simple. I mean, uh, we, we, we truly believe that uh, beauty and beauty products um, are, are, are for, for many people uh, can improve and, and change their life. Uh, and so what we try and do with all of this stuff that we're talking about is ensure that the, the sort of the end, the end product, the end thing we're delivering uh, improves uh, that consumer's experience either with our products or with beauty or with an understanding of what they should or should not be using on their skin or hair or anything else. Um, so I think we believe that as long as the end thing we're delivering, whether it's a product or a sample or a, a service or a technology, improves and delivers like like and improves their beauty experience, then I think the the value exchange is, is uh, usually for us within beauty um, more than enough for them to give that information, whatever we're asking them. Um, but we, we are quite conscious that we want to ensure that whatever it is we are asking them is of use to the, the end thing we're offering. Um, yeah, so for, for, for us, it's, um, it's not been an issue, to be honest. Uh, we are conscious of, you know, having sort of uh, data, data fatigue and not using the vast quantities of data that we do have for for, for, for not the, the the correct purpose. Yeah, I think for, I think for us, I think the point you made, there, Natalie, on on trust, um, trust has certainly come to the fore in the in the last year. So the trust that you've built up with your customers previously, um, you've been able to use through this. Now, I don't think we necessarily get into highly personalised questions. Um, we we don't necessarily need to, but I think just having that trust amongst our customers you know for, for us to ring them up out of the blue without that being a problem um, because they have that that relationship with you and, and and also just not not using their data in any other way than to benefit themselves I think again it it, it maybe isn't the most complex answer but it, it's sometimes the, the the simple things that are the best but I do I do think that you making sure in the last year we're not doing anything to break that trust as well by by trying to to do anything slightly different and what about the new customers that you haven't had the chance to build the trust with? So, you know, I hear it like any good relationship. I agree with you with data like you build trust over time. Right. And then they share people share more with you. Um, so um, where you haven't been able to have the personal connection before, um, how are you? How do you start to build that trust? Data? Yeah, I think it's, um, you, you know, as as you, you would say, you know, we use the tools that we've got. So we, we're missing one of the tools, which is that, you know, face-to-face -face interaction. But the other tools are there, you know, the products there, the, the videos online are there to tell you what it tastes like, the delivery from the person that's 
comes from the store is there to start that relationship off the you know the ability to review is there so actually if you look at all the different touch points and ways of building up trust you're not you, you know you've lost one of them but you've you know you've still got the other eight or nine so i think what happens is you you tend to focus a bit more on the things that you can do rather than the things that you can't i think there needs to be a, a, a value exchange as well i think customers more and more are realizing the value of, of their own personal data and 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 if you have a value exchange if you are providing benefits if you're using that data to help the customer um, I think most people are actually reasonably comfortable with 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 giving you data, so to speak, if you want to sort of make it sound as draconian as that. But it, it, it's it, as long as there is that value exchange. And I think from a security perspective, really customers, again, you know, they need to trust the brand overall. But but most customers will will have to sort of put a level of trust that the, the regulations around security are, are in place. Um, but it's more around the misuse of data rather than necessarily data breaches. I think most people are concerned about. And as long as you're making sure that you aren't, you're, you're, you're only using the data you have about a customer to genuinely help that customer and create that that value relationship, um, there isn't a problem. It's when there's a mismatch between those two things where the customer isn't getting value out of the data that you've got from them. Just patient, didn't he earlier? And I think that really comes into into it here educating them about the value um and you know of course also recognizing that each customer is individual and personal and learning from what people are prepared to share and not and um you know tracking the data to help you tracking their their responses to help you understand that because you know what you want to share with netflix is potentially very different from what you want to share with your insurance company how you feel about telling l'oreal about your skin might be very different from how you feel about sharing health data with someone completely different and so it's sort of treating each customer as, as the individual they are, right? And, and using data to support with that so they get that real value from you and you respect their boundaries, which you learn through your engagement with them. Yeah, and I think also um, just not doing things that might slightly jar with people. I think, you, you know, again, it's, it's just being sensible with the data that you that you ask for that's a big, yeah, I can get that because I can see where that's going to be used. But as you, as you were saying, uh, just the value exchange, not making it one way. You know, if, it, if that, I think that's the mistake that gets made sometimes is data that the client want, that the company wants, that doesn't necessarily benefit the customer too much. Yeah, a really good example of that is is you know, if you if you walk in store, you make a purchase, and after you've made the purchase, the sales assistant asks you for your email address. I think most people find that quite jarring. Whereas you don't have, you don't think twice about giving your email address over an e-com platform because you understand they need your email address in order to send you the receipts and all those sorts of things that you might do. Whereas in store, it, it doesn't necessarily feel as, as as right. So it's about making sure that there's an education piece there in terms of, and why does a sales assistant need that information? You know, why when you're doing things online as well and digitally, do is is that information needed? And if you're transparent with the customer and the customer understands where that's coming from and what the benefits are going to be for them, there's a much lower barrier to entry, I suppose, than it would be if you're just sort of trying to gather data for data's sake. I'm going to jump to some questions we've got from our audience. Um, so Lucy would like to know. Do you think that the want need um, for virtual tools will still be there post pandemic and still worth the investment? And she's speaking specifically for beauty here, but I think others are interested in what do you think the world looks like post pandemic in this space? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's quite a simple answer is yes. I mean, we, um, to be honest, all, 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 all that we've been doing this, this last year, or 18 months or so, um, we, were, we were sort of doing anyway, like our, our strategy has not changed at all. It's just accelerated it by approximately two years. So where we are today in terms of e-commerce weight of business, so the amount of sales we generate online versus offline uh, is about two years ahead of where we forecasted um, a year and a half ago. So we just, not, to be honest with you, nothing has changed. We already were on the route of uh, trying to sort of educate and talk about and deliver services to consumers uh, online digitally because we saw things moving that way anyway. Um, just this last 18 months or so has just made us go a lot quicker. Um, and that leads quite nicely to the next question, I think, from Lucy. So thank you, Lucy. Do you think that you want uh, the want? Uh, oh, no, that was, that's what I just answered, I hope. Anyway, uh, do you think there is an opportunity to combine both virtual tools within an in-store environment? How do we use what we have created over the last year to create a hybrid experience? So, yeah, so linking to the, the previous comment or the previous point, 
um, two years ago, you know, consumers would go into a Boots or a Super Drug and, and try on uh, a lipstick and look at the shade on their skin or they'd try on a, a cream to feel the consistency of the cream. Uh, now, again, with, with what's, what's happening recently, um, we, we no longer have testers in stores. Uh, but what we are implementing is um, uh, ways and communications to, to again, use the same technology uh, on our, that we have on our websites and on our retailers' websites to try on products virtually, but do that in the stores. So, um, and again, similarly, we've just seen a, a huge increase and a huge number of consumers use that um, use that service to now try on products virtually in even in stores. So really uh, merging and, and combining uh, the online and offline. I just said, I think in our in our business there'll be massive opportunities going forward. I think just it's made a massive paradigm shift for the way that our consumers use technology and how they're prepared to do so and that, that will that will stay once you've got the you know the added advantage of the personal interaction back so yeah i think certainly the pandemic has moved things at a pace that would have probably taken three or four years to do they've been done in in sound like a government advisor but done done in a few weeks kind of kind of kind of thing but yeah i, th I think it's a fabulous opportunity going forward to to use that use that change yeah, and I'd echo that. I don't think it's really changed the direction of the way that retail was going. It's just it's just accelerated it. Um, you know, I, and now virtual services, um, you know, virtual consultations, those sorts of elements are just going to be a new part of the mix that that we have in terms of channel offerings for for customers. And customers are going to expect that from retailers. Um, I think it, it has also given an increased focus on making sure that you know. Uh, Stores aren't going anywhere. We may see a few store closures, but there's still more than 30% of customers want to shop in a store primarily. Um, and, and for all the reasons that we've just discussed, but there's now an increased focus on making sure that those stores are as efficient as they possibly can be. And in areas where there's downtime, that they maximize those by leveraging the investments that we've made here to help sales assistants also do virtual services as well. which is with recent purchase trends for certain online products or wine varial tools, never know how to say that word, have you already seen and can you see more differentiation options and larger ranges for your product that you can have online versus in store? So we've seen some retailers move to sort of online only options and do you think that this offers you an option to give a bigger product range? David, uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But slightly unusual we tend to have more um more products available in in stores than we do um that we do online but um yeah i think with the with the options you've got available now in terms of delivery and mo moving products around and that that ability i think it it certainly gives the opportunity to widen i mean we have thousands of products available anyway you know that's quite a that's quite a lot but um yeah i think it again it, it's how you um for us how you integrate the local store and the local advantages with with the with the website people will, will often buy let's say you know their day-to-day -day drinking wine that they know what they want from the website but if you know if you get to christmas for example and you want to spend 25 30 quid a bottle on then they'll go to the store because there's you know a different range and you can find out what you actually want so i think it's how we how we get all of our channels to to work together to the customer's advantage uh, businesses with is sort of portfolio optimization at a local level right so in different stores you want different products are going to have a better uh, reception you don't want to be stacking every shop with all the same products um, and exactly the same ranges um, and you can't fit all of your ranges in um, a small shop so um, as the advantage of online is that you know they get to do all of that and that's where you can use data as we've talked about today to really be a filter for that personalization and um, because what you do also don't want to do is serve them up with thousands and thousands and thousands of things online that they've got to select for themselves and all these tools that we talk about and the way you can use data the way you can use vr and ar is all about sort of trying to distill that choice down um for the customer to make it make it personalized and to make it um not overwhelming as an experience um, yeah. They'll think, well, I'll go into the shop because at least then someone will guide me to one of the five things I can pick instead of one of the five million. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I think that's a really interesting one. That that kind of oh, isn't it brilliant to have a huge choice? But a lot of people, I think, in 
in wine that's just overwhelming for people you just get this uh, i'm bound not to pick the best one because there's so many others um and actually sort of that editing that choice for the consumer and pushing them to what using the data to just help them push you know discover wines as close to what they they want as possible so to a certain extent you want less choice rather than more more choice every focus group i sit in people just say give me tell me what you think i will like you know give me a personalized offer that that's the that's the thing they want and that links nicely to karen's question for you david which is have you used virtual or automated tools to onboard all those first time customers i think you had 150,000 in about 6 months didn't you um, into repeat purchases yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to, to a certain extent, well, you know where where we are, Natalie, in terms of some of that some of that work. So um, I I think it is certainly an opportunity it, within our, with on with onboarding to um, to do that. I think one of the things we have tried to do though is keep um, particularly with new customers, just keep a level of communication going, not just on products, but on you know updating customers on. The, the latest restrictions in store, etc. So our communication has moved from you know 100% sort of product based to 70% product based and 30% how to how to help or how to ease the shop base. So you know all of our emails would contain messages about the latest COVID restrictions in store or how you could contact your local store. So a bit a little bit more about the how um, as well as the what. Yeah, and there are there are AI tools we we help clients with, which basically from the very first data that you capture on them from their first purchase, you can have a more accurate prediction on when they'll want to purchase something next and what they'll want to purchase next. And as as because you basically can compare them to other customers like them from their sort of history, and then you know when you can put the right nudges in. And of course, as you learn more about them, once you've got them from first to second purchase, and then hopefully on. Or beyond that, then it can become more and more personalised as a journey. So, um, that's that's um, definitely um, happening with lots of brands. And then, um, Kim, we've talked about Camilla's question. We've got a question for Nick from Alistair. Has it changed how you can have relationships with customers for lower price products? So things like a Garnier shampoo. Thank you, Alistair. Good question. Um, yes, yes, it has. Um, so typically, uh, typically the products that sell well online are what we call our selective distribution um, or our selected uh, selected products which are uh, brands and products which you can't get anywhere in the, in the, in the physical stores so fragrances for example uh, has a huge weight of business online uh, some of the higher priced products such as uh, uh, Lancome uh, Kiehl's um, YSL makeup Armani makeup um, so the, the, the products which are quite hard to get hold of uh, in physically are the ones that do really well online. And the, the, the same is equally equally applies to those products which we call uh, our mass products, which basically everyone uses, everyone washes, or I hope everyone except Alistair washes uh, their hair. Um, uh, so those products which, which, which everyone uses is typically not sold as much uh, online, but more sold in physical stores. So what we've try to do to to kind of uh, to compensate that is look at what might make people consumers purchase those mass products like uh, like uh, shampoo um, online so what we look at doing is things like like bundling very simple but bundling so if you use a Garnier shampoo as an example and we notice that that consumer has bought that product uh, a couple of times you would bundle it into into five of the same shampoos a slightly lower price point um, uh, and so we can get uh, number one bigger margin on our side but also deliver uh, to the consumer a better price for, for the product which we know they uh, are using over and over again that's just one example another example is what we call regime uh, regime uh, purchases so rather than just selling one cleanser which is it's a mass product or, or one uh, lower price point moisturizer we might um, sell a cleanser toner and a moisturizer together at a nice attractive price point so to again try and prompt consumers purchasing those types of products online um, and then equally um, I think in terms of our product development we're starting to do more and more on these types of mass products where looking at different sizes of products so again larger sizes so again giving consumers kind of um, uh, more choice online compared to uh, in, in stores um, so yeah some of the examples that we're trying to sort of play around with and test to 
to try and uh, prompt consumers to purchase these products, these types of products, uh, more online versus uh, versus in store. Uh, had a shaved head, which is why he doesn't use anything to wash his hair, as opposed to he's not hygienic. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> baseball, but yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, one for you, Dan. Do you think chatbots or AI will ever be able to pick up some of the interactions that customers are getting used to doing virtually, um, so that they can help learn about products? And I know, um, I think Dixon's Carphone have been doing some uh, sort of work on this lately, so that they get this sort of um, great great um, connection where they would still have asked someone what TV should they buy, et cetera, and they've been able to sort of recreate that in the pandemic. So, you know, do you think that's going to take over? Have you seen that happening well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a there, definitely the answer in terms of picking up some of those interactions is yes. Um, I think it's worth separating out possibly some of the hype around AI from the realities. Um, you know, chatbots, chatbots, especially in AI in general, is a you know, they're user experience tools. They help us get to information faster. They will help us um, do you know do things that possibly we can already do now, but just in a more convenient way. Um, so, a, a, a sort of a bit of an example of that is um, some of the people most comfortable with with voice activated systems and, and chatbots are under sixteen year olds, but also over fifty year olds. And the reason for that is because those are the two groups of people that don't really like using a lot of the sort of graphical user interfaces. It's quite complicated. And it's it's easier to just actually type something or talk to somebody. Um, and the, 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 where where it's not going to replace is that sort of you know in context, real, genuine, personal experience. Um, so I think it's 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 definitely going to be useful for a variety of different things that currently we have to ask people for, or we have to go into complicated menus for, like what's happened with my delivery, what's going on here, what things you've got nice offers on, those sorts of things, as well as some of the more um, uh, interesting elements, I suppose, that we were talking about before, about like what actually what what things can I tell you about myself that could be interesting precursors that maybe even a, a sales assistant or somebody who's an expert in the field doesn't necessarily know. Um, but the the real benefits I think will come when both of those two things are used together. When chatbots and AI are used to filter out some of the stuff that isn't really, you know, you don't really need a personal interaction for, but also used to aid sales assistants and to aid customers make better decisions and give more context to to what's going on. So I think the answer to that is yes, but also it's not going to replace everything that's currently there. It's just going to be an additional tool. Reviews earlier, um, and we we know from our relationship with FIFO, um, working for them, how important they can be in affecting um, somebody's brand and somebody's influence. Um, you, have you tried using peer to peer influencing to help guide customers in their purchase decisions? Any of you, and what success have you seen with that? What challenges have you seen with that? Dan, you were nodding, so I'm going to pick on you. But a, a big area that is, especially since the pandemic has, has moved forward quite quickly, is um, sort of one-to-many masterclasses. So where you've actually got multiple people, um, I suppose, you know, in business, we, we do things like webinars, but 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 it's, a, you know, an extension of that, but more for consumer focus. So where you have a single sales assistant maybe driving a group of people, people that know each other or peers, um, actually having conversations about different products as well. So I think that's a big area of, of expansion at the moment. And I think... Um, that's something we'll see more and more of um, because the actual the propensity to buy is higher when you're doing that. You know, there's a confidence setting there where you know you've got you've got reinforcement from your peers um, as well as sort of general reviews as well. So we're, one of the things that um, we're doing a lot of is in this sort of uh, virtual consultation space, we are showing customers reviews about a product so so that they've got sort of secondary confirmation it's not just what the sales assistant is telling them there's, there's there's other reviews and other reinforcement mechanisms that they see at the same time so that they can really start to gain benefit from both of those things so yes i think it's got a big part to play but it's it's sort of quite early on the road for, for that at the moment yeah we we, we see an interesting thing on certainly some of some of our reviews if if there is a, a negative one that I mean, quite a lot of your own customers come in and uh, help you out on uh, on replying to <laughs> re replying to those ones as well. But I think reviews certainly have been uh, even more brought to the fore in in the last week, particularly around service. I think it, it's something that we've looked at extremely extremely closely. Uh, particularly, as I say, uh, Trustpilot etc. has been pretty valuable in that area. And we, we, we've uh, just on, on our side within Beauty, we, we spend a lot of time, number one, looking at all the reviews that, that are being posted. And reviews, 
is a, I suppose is one way of looking at it, but also we look at it in terms of more 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 comments and what's the conversation that what are people talking about our brands, whether it's good or bad, and yes, it might be a review. And then we have a big, big focus on uh, reply rates. So across all of the social channels, so Instagram, uh, Twitter, etc., uh, and also all of our own channels, and also on our retailer retailer channels, um, we whenever a consumer is is writing a comment or a question um, about one of our products, we want to reply to absolutely every one of those that is appropriate to reply to. So we have a, an ambition to of a hundred percent reply rate. And then uh, an ambition to to apply to all of those comments and reviews and questions uh, within a time frame of, of approximately five hours. And um, so there are there are sort of benchmarks, and we we have sort of various technologies and um, processes in place to try and try and meet those. So, for example, some some of the comments and questions we have like an automated response if it's a quite a generic comment or, or, or review or question, uh, and then for the slightly more um, in depth questions and comments and reviews, we'll, we'll we have a, quite a large team who are responding directly um, by email, by telephone, by uh, by the comment section on on, on the Instagram channels, etc. So yeah, yeah, it's a huge, 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 huge uh, part. And we know, for example, we know if we can get 50, 50 reviews live. Uh, upon launch of a, of a product of ours, it increases conversion rate by around 28%. So we know that from, from the data that we, have, that we have on those products that we do have uh, do have reviews for and those we don't. And so that's kind of, again, the, the magic number is 50. And then there's a big job on recency. So if you see a review that's five years old versus a review that's a week old, you're going to naturally kind of trust and be have a more sort of authentic perspective on the one that's more more recent. So we have a big project on ensuring the, the recency of, of all the reviews that, that are about our products. About we've talked, you know, you we we've all mentioned quite large brand names here, and some pretty big um, and potentially scary technology. Are there any tips? For a small business who might be on this webinar um, about how they help their ch customers choose products when they perhaps have limited time and budget and um, so any tips on what's the best bang for their buck overcomplicate um simple simple channels you, you know the telephone is you know and having that just that direct conversation if you're you know and we're at the smaller end versus supermarket so you can have that personal relationship and it doesn't necessarily mean millions invested in technology uh it's just opening up different channels that you can you can do and i, I think that's you know that there are some things that every brand can do as no matter what size they are and just making it easier for for customers however big their customer base is absolutely absolutely agree i think we have a tendency to to make things overly complicated when we're talking about data and all the different tools and platforms that we're using to optimize and personalize, et cetera. But honestly, um, depending on what product and, and uh, area of, area of um, you know, business you're in, ultimately <laughs> consumers are asking questions and they want information about beauty. And it's our job to try and supply the answer to those questions and, and provide those answers in as, in as many places where consumers are spending their time. And then if they want to purchase one of those products, they will. I mean, the massive shift in, in uh, you know, push marketing versus pull. Last, you know, 10 years or so ago, it's all about push advertising. Now it's just, uh, it's the, the exact opposite. So it doesn't really matter what we do. If a consumer um, wants one of our products and they can find the answers to their, their concerns or their questions about beauty or about skincare or hair care. Um, and we, it's our job to supply the answer to those and then give as much information um, and then if they want to purchase, they will. And that's really, really our strategy comes down to that is providing and creating a huge breadth and depth of content about our products and our brands and our stories and putting them in as many places as possible. And then, um, and, uh, and then supplying the ways to, for, for those consumers to purchase our products as easily and as quickly as possible. Um, so I absolutely agree. Don't make things too complicated. Yeah, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd say the, the same as well in terms of just there's, there isn't a need to, to invest in huge amounts of, of those sorts of systems if you're a small business. And and your consumers, actually, even big retailers are, are utilizing consumer technology, which is available to everybody. You know, Zoom and Twitter and Instagram and all of those things are where your consumers are. So, you know, phone and email 
are, are actually some of the best channels that you can use. And one of the big advantages if you're a smaller company is you have a more personal touch by just the nature of, the, of your size and you have the ability to invest in your customers in that way. I think where a small business could really invest in technology is, is technology that helps them with the administration of that. So where small businesses can often fall down is the follow-up. They can build great personal, personal relationships, great customer experience, but the administration afterwards to follow up, to make sure that you know, if a customer hasn't shopped with you for a while, might, maybe you get back in touch with them, those sorts of things are really where a small business can, can maximize um, its opportunities, I suppose. So, so I, I, would, I would suggest uh, if you're gonna invest in technology and you're a small business, invest in the technology that helps you follow up, keep track of your customers, do that sort of relationship management administration. Um, don't worry about all the sort of fancy tools on the front end of e-commerce systems and things like that. Use what's out of the box, use, use the areas where customers are already already at, you know, use those channels. You've also seen um, a lot on local level of small businesses, you know, right at the start of pandemic, utilizing facebook forums and that to sell their to sell their products very quickly you know particularly products that people couldn't get uh so you know even really really small companies if you just look at those sort of simple channels that are, are available and i think one of the things that's that's proved is that is that actually you don't need to be a, a big brand with a really flashy website to build trust with a customer um, you know, customers are willing to actually engage on a, on a much more local level and maybe a you know not a swish Facebook page as opposed to a big e-commerce site, but but they can still gain trust in other ways. Yeah, and I also think it's a myth um, that some of this technology is super expensive, right? It, data isn't actually that expensive to use and you can make some quite big wins on the admin side, as you say, with, with um, data or with um, technology to just sort of support the people to do that really personalized experience. And it doesn't necessarily need to be some big complicated system a big bang approach and actually often SMEs it's the sort of fuel that can help SMEs easily outstrip um, some of their larger competitors because they don't necessarily have all the same overheads that the larger competitors do so if they can invest wisely then um, that can make a big difference just to support their time and um, we have got one final question from Rebecca but um, I'm conscious of time so I'm going to um, sort of thank everybody and let people drop off and then I'm going to see if anyone will kindly stay and uh, answer Rebecca's question so she's not left wondering but a huge thank you um, to our speakers and um, for all the many insights that they've shared I think um, you know really fascinating to see what's going on and also really brilliant to hear the range of look there are some really simple things everybody can put in place and also then you can get to really amazing technology which can identify exactly what's going on with your skin without you even being in front of somebody like that that might be the gold standard but it's it's amazing that we have the technology that can do that and um, that brands can use uh, but there's some really small steps that people can get started with if that all feels a little bit out of reach so um i think what we have concluded is that um we can persuade customers in fact we can convert even more customers um through the digital um buy before you try experience um, and it can be really positive and it is here to stay and can be a real tool for retailers thank you nick thank you dan thank you david for giving your time um, it's been really great to chat with you um, thank you to everybody who's joined and for all your questions which have made this so much more interesting um, and have a great rest of the day i'm now going to ask if any of the speakers would kindly give rebecca an answer to the question that the food industry is looking into direct to consumer model as an area for growth bypassing larger uk demands from retailers and is this a key part of your thinking in 2022 and i'm wondering nick obviously you have experience of both um uh both both sides of the, the D2C and D2, uh, direct to consumer and through other businesses coin. I can get my words right. And um, David, you are quite a good example of getting on with going direct to consumer. So you perhaps both have some thoughts on this. Yeah, just just quickly from us, it, it depends on the on the market. So in the UK, for example, uh, I'm guessing most people are, um, are from the UK here. Uh, in the UK, we have uh, approximately 16 D2C sites. Uh, we have a portfolio of 32 different brands. No, I lied, 36 different brands, sorry. So we have a portfolio of 36 different brands, 16 of those have a D2C uh, website. Um, the vast majority of our sales still come from our, our retail partners and, and pure players. Um, so for us, the sort of rationale to launch or not launch a D2C is like, is basically why would a consumer purchase on on, a, on a, one of our own websites versus just purchasing uh, elsewhere? And so that comes that becomes the, the first question. Um, and then that leads to sort of uh, the business case and the overheads of it's quite quite costly to, to run a DTC site. 
but ultimately it comes down to the consumer need and consumer centricity of why they would purchase uh, on, on one of our own sites. So some of our brands that make sense, some of our brands that doesn't make sense. So Kiehl's, for example, those consumers who use Kiehl's, the, the brand Kiehl's are incredibly loyal. Um, they uh, are obsessed by, by the, 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 brand, the brands and the products that Kiehl's sell. Um, and they quite often buy a multitude of, of brands within and under the Kiehl's portfolio. So for the Kiehl's brand, it makes total sense to have a D2C. For another brand like Garnier um, or Laura Paris, it doesn't make sense. It just simply doesn't make sense. When we look at the profit margins on, on, on the products, when we look at the mass distribution of those products, it just doesn't make sense. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's uh, kind of, kind of my, my answer to that one. I think, yeah, actually, said, yeah, I think obviously D2C is our um, direct to consumer is our, is our big thing, whether whatever channel you go through, um, I think, you, you know, you, you do see you can buy from individual wine, um, you know, wine suppliers themselves. And that will always be part of a quite a, an open market that we that we work in. But I think that's that's our model that we will be uh, sticking very close to. And I, I, as I say, you've yeah. been able to take a lot of the business that, you know, where people have previously bought in supermarkets and and others and, and really show the value of your experts, because that's the real specialism in Majestic, right? That you can have that D to C connection because you have these amazing trained experts who know everything about wine. And actually that it's the value add again, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, right. the interesting one, um, it, you, you know, people often obviously supermarkets are there they're extremely convenient but um i think we've been able to show a lot of customers new customers in the last year the the benefits of actually making that slightly different trip for you know one of your products and the you know the, there's a lot of value to be gained out of that you probably get a product closer to what you want um and uh, hopefully that that will continue I'd probably just add to that as well that um from a a D2C model, I think, is a, is a wider trend, not just in the food industry. I think over the over the past few years, we've seen our client base shift from sort of more regular retailers more and more towards brands who are who are doing D2C. So I think it is a it's a, it is a generalized shift, and I think just as I say before, it will depend on the brand and it'll depend on things like the, you know, the profit margins and those sorts of things and the distribution. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be a big part of the retail sector. Yeah, and we see saying we work with a lot of FMCG companies and they're saying, well, why don't we do this ourselves? And actually, because otherwise we know less and less about our customers because we don't have the data that we need to understand them, which is sort of what we've been talking about today. And actually, when you have that direct to consumer relationship, you can improve your product um, because you can understand more about how people are using it, what they want from it. Um, and so actually that that sort of direct connection to the customer can be really, really important. Um, you know, when we built the coaching recommendation engine, we had to do it with no customer data. We had to go out and get all panel data because they didn't have any at that point in time. Um, it makes a real difference when you work with a business that's um, got all the data and transactions and insights about their customers for what you can really, you know, what you can really do um, and how personally you can power and connection and communication. So um, I think it's um, it's always a very important route to consider and Nick's given you some checklist items to, to ask yourself when you're going down that route. So hopefully that answers your question, Rebecca. Thank you so much to our speakers for staying on um, and for all their wisdom today. Thank you to everyone for joining and um, we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the good rest of the day. Ciao.